Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, although we are not together in one space, it's a beautiful day here in Washington, D.C. And as yesterday was International Women's Day, it's such a pleasure to have two such impressive women leaders here to join us for this important conversation about human rights challenges facing the Biden administration. I'm Melissa Stewart. I'm the Dash Muse Teaching Fellow and an adjunct professor of law here at Georgetown Law, where I oversee the daily operations of the Human Rights Institute. The Human Rights Institute's mission is to promote understanding of and respect for human rights and the practice of human rights law and to develop Georgetown Law's place as a global leader in human rights. We have with us today Acting Assistant Secretary Lisa Peterson and Drynan Chair for Human Rights Lisa Massimino. Acting Assistant Secretary Peterson is a senior official for civilian security, democracy, and human rights, and the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Prior to this role, Acting Assistant Secretary Peterson served as the Director for the Office of the Multilateral and Global Affairs in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. As a Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Cameroon, um, she built upon a long and distinguished career in foreign service, holding positions in Nigeria, Kenya, Zambia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Africa, and the Central African Republic. She has long worked on issues related to democratic transitions, human rights, refugee protection, and supporting transitions to peace through negotiation. It is a privilege to welcome Acting Assistant Secretary Peterson here with us today. Also with us is Elisa Massimino, who is currently the Robert F. Drynan SJ Chair in Human Rights at Georgetown Law. This chair is named after Father Drynan, who is one of the nation's leading advocates for international human rights. Professor Massimino has a distinguished record of human rights advocacy in Washington, D.C., having testified before Congress dozens of times. She spent 27 years with Human Rights First, the last decade of which she was serving as president and CEO. Professor Massimino was recently a senior fellow with the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University and serves on the board or advisory councils of human rights organizations, such as RFK Human Rights and Refugees International. In addition to her role as Drynan Chair at Georgetown, Professor Massimino is currently a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Thank you so much for joining us as well, Professor Massimino. Before we begin, just a quick housekeeping note. If anyone would like to ask questions for our speakers, there is a Q&A section on the bottom um, bar where you can ask questions. We'll get to audience Q&A towards the end of our time, but feel free to ask a question at any time. So obviously, with all of the news that we see every day, there are enormous amounts of human rights challenges that are facing the Biden administration, both here at home and abroad. Acting Assistant Secretary Peterson, I'd like you to start our conversation, and I'm wondering if you could tell us what are some of the top human rights challenges facing the administration, and what are your priorities for addressing them? And what does the Biden administration hope to achieve in terms of human rights? Wow, not a small question to start with. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join today. It's a real privilege to get to engage with a group that is so committed to human rights and democracy. Um, you know, obviously, I think folks follow the news. You can see what the immediate day-to-day -day challenges are, the things that come across our screens on a regular basis, Ethiopia, Burma, Xinjiang. Um, and that's... Uh, that tends to be um, a consistent operating space on the, the human rights front, not, not necessarily those particular countries, but the need to be responsive to um, countries that have really kind of gone off the deep end. Um, I think the big difference with this administration is the way that they have very explicitly and publicly put front and center that we're going to be approaching not just the immediately obvious human rights challenges, but our foreign policy as a whole with human rights and democracy at the center. Um, and that, you know, that is, uh, 
something that is going to re require a little bit of cultural sh shift within the department, um, within the U.S. government as a whole. I think we have good foundations to build upon, but I also think there are a number of adjustments that, that are going to have to happen. Um, I think one of the big, big things that is going to occupy a lot of our time in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, others in the department, others across the US government, is the president's intention to host a summit for democracy, um, which we see as really a necessary step to get governments back together and really focused around the issue of democracy, democratic backsliding. How are we stopping countries from backsliding? And how are we really pushing into and, and growing that democratic space? Um, and we have the added challenge of doing that in the context of um, recent events in the United States and conversations around systemic racism and um, the, the events of January 6th. And what does this say about our democracy? Um, so we, we approach this all with, with a fair amount of humility, um, but do see it as something that it's necessary for us to engage on. Um, I had one other thought there, but it has slipped my mind. So I will hand the floor back to you. Well, if I could ask a quick follow-up question. When you say that human rights will be at the center of foreign policy and some adjustments need to be made, can you elaborate on that a little more? What specific sort of adjustments or shifts in thinking are, are you talking about? Um, things like questions around arms transfers and the degree to which human rights has been considered um, in the context of those sales. Um, I think we need to have a, a more fulsome conversation around that, that type of issue. I also, um, you know, to, to be a little more expansive, I think we're having a little bit more open and forward-leaning conversations about the ways in which um, democracy and human rights issues feed into what would other be seen, uh, might otherwise be seen as the responsibility of another bureau in the Department of State. So, you know, the democracy, human rights, anti-corruption issues that underlie migration, um, or the nexus between um, human rights, good governance, corruption, and environmental issues and climate change. Um, and so I think we, we're feeling like we have a little bit more open environment for engagement in spaces where we might not have either traditionally been engaged or not have had as much of a voice. That makes a lot of sense. And Professor Massimino, I'd love, I love your thoughts and reaction to this. But in addition, you know, with every change in administration, there's this opportunity to establish a fresh vision and set a new tone in both domestic and foreign policy for human rights. And I know this is an area that you've given a lot of thought to. Um, so I'd love your thoughts. And do you think there is an opportunity here for a more radical reimagination of our approach to human rights, either in line with what Acting Assistant Secretary Peterson just said, or maybe in a different way of approaching it? Yes, um, and I also just want to say thank you so much, uh, Melissa, for uh, chairing this conversation and Acting Assistant Secretary Lisa Peterson for joining us and for all of you who are watching. Uh, really, it takes a special kind of person to look at a computer screen when we're having the first <laughs> beautiful day <laughs> in a long time. Uh, so thank you all for, for choosing human rights today. Um, uh, well, you know, the um, President Biden campaigned on this idea of Build Back Better, which I think is a, a great kind of anchor for us in how we think about the role that human rights should play in the new administration. Um, it's a lot more of a shift than simply, say, uh, 
you know, rejecting the previous administration's, um, you know, approach under, say, the the Commission on Unalienable Rights, for example, which really sought to create a hierarchy of rights and put uh, freedom of religion and, and property rights ahead of all other rights. That kind of misguided thing, I think, um, has rightly been uh, pushed aside by this administration. But if you think about, you know, this may be one of those uh, one of those examples, Melissa, where um, the radical thing is getting is actually going back to the origins uh, um, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was itself quite a radical document in 1948. Um, and I think in some respects, what, what would constitute a, a transformative uh, new approach to human rights uh, by the United States would be kind of getting back to these three central uh, ideas as I see it in the Universal Declaration. First, we need uh, a kind of renewed understanding of, of the essential wisdom kind of at the heart of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is that respect for human rights is not some kind of utopian ideal. It's actually a strategy grounded in the horrible experience of World War II and the Holocaust, a strategy to ensure global peace and security. And that means that every nation has a stake in how other nations treat their people, because we are all in this together. Global peace and security actually depends on the universal respect for inherent dignity of all people. And so what does that kind of rhetoric mean in practice? I, I think it um, and here's maybe where the you know more modern conception of of a radical idea is that we we I think we need to abandon this this misleading myth of that what we want to do is try to strike that golden balance between values and interests, um, like security against uh, human rights, which we often hear even from those who profess a great. Uh, um, uh, desire to advance human rights. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that human rights trump security at all or other national interests. Um, but I think the wisdom of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that respect for human rights, it's not a trump, it is the foundation. And without uh, policies that strengthen that foundation, um, we are going to uh, fail in achieving our, our national interests, our pursuit of our national interests. And I think what we've got so many examples, but it's a lesson that, that we have to keep learning, it seems. Um, and that is that, that short-term trade-offs against human rights almost always come back to bite us in the end, um, in the long run. And, and the long run is getting shorter and shorter all the time. Uh, I know we're going to talk about Saudi Arabia, but that's there's an example of of the long run getting getting shorter. Um, you know, why do we think that Mohammed bin Salman uh, got the idea that it was okay uh, to engineer the murder of, of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, a resident of the United States? Why why did he get that idea? Um, lack of clarity, I think, is one reason about our values. So, so getting back to that is is one kind of piece, I think, of this radical renewal and revival mission. And the second piece is, I think, we need to understand in a deeper way the interconnectedness of what are called civil and political rights, like the freedom of conscience and. Uh, the right of free speech, the right to be free from torture, uh, the right to enjoy these rights free of discrimination, for example, and so-called economic, social, and cultural rights, like the right to adequate housing and food and, and education. And together, those rights form the basis for a life of dignity for people. And the intersecting violations of those rights, for example, that we see in the criminal justice system here in the United States, I think really are bringing home to people that we can't ever guarantee, say, for example, due process until we stop criminalizing poverty. So it, that really 
brings together, I think, uh, in a way that the the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights understood that these these types of rights are interconnected. And and lastly, I think the third piece of this is that we we really need to take. Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, famous observation about where do human rights begin uh, to heart. Um, Mrs. Roosevelt was one of the architects of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights and its adoption. And she said, I'll paraphrase just a little bit, where after all do human rights begin? In small places close to home so close and so small that they do not appear on any maps of the world, but they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood they live in, the school they attend, the farm or office or factory where they work. Those are the places where everyone seeks equal dignity, equal justice, equal opportunity without discrimination. And unless those rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere without concerted citizen action to uphold these rights close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. So that's a long quote, but that I think that really is, is important for a, a, a revival of, of the centrality of human rights to our daily lives. Um, take just, for example, the right to housing. Uh, Article uh, 11 um, uh, of the... Uh, of the economic, social, and cultural covenant, I think it is, uh, talks about the right of everyone to an adequate standard of living and an adequate housing. And just to get back to the Biden administration, President Biden campaigned on this idea of making housing not a privilege, but to view it as a right, just as President Obama talked about moving towards a, a, a thinking about healthcare being a human right. Um, and, and the person that President Biden has tapped to be the uh, the leader of uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge, has, has talked about how do you operationalize that? Um, what does it mean when so few of the people in our country who are eligible for public housing vouchers are actually getting access to them? And what can we do to fix it? Um, and that's kind of, I think, what Eleanor Roosevelt meant about bringing human rights uh, close to home. So that that's kind of a, I think the, the it's not a new vision, it's an old vision, um, but it was radical and it would be radical to adopt it again today. So acting Assistant Secretary Peterson, I'm wondering if any of that resonates with you and how you're approaching um, your new approach to human rights, specifically, you know, we've been strong on civil and political rights and a call to elevate um, the social, economic, and cultural rights. Um, I appreciate that you think we've been strong on civil and political rights. I, frankly, I think there's a lot that, a lot more that we can be doing in that space. And um, speaking, honestly about sort of our our overseas staffing levels i know you know other countries in the world would smack me for saying this but our embassies overseas in a lot of places are very small to be able to really deal expansively with that universe of issues and so what you end up with is kind of a triage and i think certainly my approach was looking at the rights piece as foundational to the other pieces that we wanted to fall into place. Um, you know, lessening the income gap, putting the government in a position to assume their own responsibility for um, the basic health care needs of their citizens. But they can't do that if they don't if they're not able to attract investment and they can't attract investment if they don't have a country where investors are confident in the rule of law and people feel that they have the, the means to really um, select their government and hold their government to account. And so in that triage, in, in my thinking, it's, it's more important to get to those foundational issues because once you have um, 
those pieces in place, then you're in a better position and, and the various governments that we work with are in better positions to fill the rest of that economic and social space. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things that Professor Massimino touched on in alluding to um, Eleanor Roosevelt's speech about human rights begin at home is this idea that Secretary Blinken has also stressed, which is that the distinctions that we have thought of between domestic and foreign policy are not really as sharp as they really once were, and that, as he said, our strength at home determines our strength in the world. Um, so I'm wondering how you've started incorporating this within your work um, and how you've tried to really directly interconnect um, human rights work within your domestic and foreign policy approach. So I would say it's still sort of early days and a work in progress, but um, you know, the one thing that really comes most immediately to mind is our universal periodic review, um, because we did make our submissions. Um, we, this, this should all go public soon, I hope. Um, we responded to more than 300 recommendations. And that's really the place where our, for, for us as DRL, our foreign policy intersects with our domestic policy. And um, having to present the case to, to Geneva, um, but also coming away with those pieces that we have made commitments on and having to work on the domestic side of the house um, to understand what we can do policy-wise to really bring these issues, uh, bring, bring our commitments to fruition. Now, I do think, um, particularly in light of the, uh, the events of last summer and uh, all of the discussion around systemic racism in the United States right now, um, our domestic situation has entered into foreign policy conversations or conversations with foreign governments, foreign civil society actors in a way that they haven't before. Not that they have never been there before. You know, there, there's always been um, a, a certain amount of back and forth. Um, but there is a prominence to them now that really we have to be mindful of what is happening within our own country and how how that translates into what we're trying to do overseas. I, it's also been interesting for me, um, a number of offices in, well, I think every office in the Department of State has created a diversity and inclusion or diversity, equity, and inclusion council. Um, and it's already clear how bureaus and offices are thinking about not just how we, the State Department, are living those diversity and inclusion pieces and how we're both better recruiting but also retaining and really living into the inclusion piece, um, but either using our experiences overseas to broaden our conversations around what is happening in our bureaus. So, you know, for DRL, that was um, a conversation with colleagues at Department of Justice uh, on their work around race and prosecutions and incarceration. Um, our International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau was talking about how they have really taken a look because they do police training overseas and they now need to really think about are we working with entities that are not adhering to best practices here in the United States? So I will say there's, there's definitely a, a change in feeling, for lack of a better word, in how we're looking at what would normally be just an inward looking Department of State, how are we running our operations? There's a much more, a much higher level of awareness of how that inward sort of operational focus really is connected to what we're doing overseas as well. 
I'm so glad you talked about sort of the prominence of some of these challenges that we're facing at home on the global stage. I think last summer was such a pivotal time for everyone, both in sort of the hopefulness and seeing the response to the injustice that um, the killing of George Floyd was, but also the response and the crackdown that happened. And, you know, I think a lot of people took note when 45 independent experts of the special procedures joined together and issued a statement on those protests that the world was watching and it was a rejection of the fundamental racial inequality and discrimination um, that's really characterized our life here um, for black people and people in co of color for a really long time. Um, and I'm wondering, Professor Massimino, I know you've thought a little bit about the universal periodic review process a bit and some of the um, challenges that people have asked us to address. And I wonder if you have thoughts on priorities of things that really are urgently needing attention. Well, that's a long list, but, um, but first I would wanna say, you know, uh, I'm glad also that you raised the, this, this process um, of the uh, universal periodic review, which there may be people who are watching who don't really understand what that is, but it was a, a, an innovation as, as part, I believe, as part of the re reforms uh, that created the UN Human Rights Council, the idea being that every country in the world would have a, a periodically a, a, a time when they could submit a self-evaluation of how well they are doing uh, living up to their human rights commitments and be examined, uh, you know, by um, uh, at the Human Rights Council uh, with recommendations for how to how to change and better live up to those. Uh, and you know, I think that that is an important process um, that happens, you know, internationally, but there's a domestic side of that that can be a, a, a huge opportunity to engage Americans in thinking about those rights close to home and the relevance they have globally, the resonance that they have with others uh, who are struggling uh, to, uh, to achieve these rights in their own countries. Um, there was you know, a huge missed opportunity uh, to, you know, um, put it mildly under the Trump administration to engage uh, Americans in, in that debate around the, the um, UPR for the United States. Um, but going forward, I think we can plan for a, a very robust um, engagement. Uh, and it's something that, that, uh, that was I think pioneered under the Obama administration and could really be advanced um, next time around. I do think that it's important as we as we approach these processes with, as you said, uh, great humility about our own imperfections. There are those that would say, you know, the United States should sit down and be quiet for a while because, you know. Um, we're not doing so well on a lot of, of uh, our rights commitments. Um, and I really, while I share the commitment to humility, um, I, in fact, as the Drinan chair, I gave a lecture of my Drinan lecture last year was called Chutzpah and Humility, Twin Virtues for Saving the World. And I'm, I'm big on humility. Um, but I don't think that it should mean that we abandon advocating for our values as some people, not you, uh, Assistant Secretary, uh, but, but some people would have us do. And, and I, um, I, I saw after uh, the attempted coup here on January 6th, I saw a beautiful statement by our ambassador um, uh, in Uganda, um, Ambassador Natalie Brown about that really encapsulated this idea that our strength as a nation on human rights does not come from from our perfection, but it comes from our struggle to form a more per perfect union. And so, in a way, you know, the way we engage with the with the uh, 
Human Rights Council, for example, and, and other entities and, and in our bilateral uh, um, relationships in a way that we can acknowledge our own imperfections and use the way that we deal with them as an example of how to move forward, I think can be a really, really powerful one. So the example is not so much of our goodness or our perfection, but the example is of the struggle and that we are perpetually engaging in here at home uh, to um, to advance rights and and to live up to you know close that gap between our ideals and our actions. So one of the other areas that really touches on our challenges here at home and abroad is the global refugee crisis and how we deal with migrants within our own borders and people seeking asylum within our own borders and how we're helping to solve the refugee crisis around the world. And I think that people were quite encouraged by some of the early action by the Biden administration, particularly the February 4th executive order um, that talked about rebuilding and enhancing our programs on, around refugee resettlement, and also that it um, addressed climate change migration, which was something that I think was new for a lot of people to be coming from the administration. Um, I wanna focus a little bit specifically on refugee resettlement, um, you know, when we resettle refugees, we're taking on such a small fraction of the global refugee population, which is now estimated to be about 26 million people worldwide. And I think people were really encouraged to see that President Biden's commitment to raise the cap on refugee resettlement to 125,000 people per year, compared to the low that it reached um, in the last year of the Trump administration of 15,000. And even that commitment extending to this current fiscal year of 62 thousand people. Um, but I think there's been a bit of concern that in recent days we've seen in the press that the State Department had to go ahead and cancel flights for at least 260 people because the Trump administration order is still in place, that while we have the executive order, we haven't gone ahead and taken the step of the presidential determination, so we're not working towards meeting that goal. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, if we can see that enacted a little bit sooner, and if we can certainly see some change coming in. In the next weeks. So I am not the best person to, to speak to about the nuts and bolts of our the, the the activities of our Bureau of Population Refugees and Migration. Um, I I can say, um, having been in meetings with those folks, that I think they they are as concerned and as uh, frustrated, if I can if, dare say that word, um, with how things are not moving forward in the way that they thought they would. Um, you know, this is, this is a bureau that is getting the opportunity to do the work that they really signed up to do. Um, and it is these, uh, these, legal issues and process issues that are that are tripping things up. Um, I do, you know, this is clearly a high priority commitment of the administration. Um, we want to get back to the role that we had in the world of really establishing a pathway to to have people be able to resettle here and and both play our part in the world on this and sort of set an example for other countries on this. Um, in the meantime, you know, I know people are trying to find ways to mitigate the impacts of this slower than hoped for rollout of this improvement of processes and, and raising the numbers, raising the ceilings. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, then I think it might make sense to shift a little bit more to talking about um, some of the commitments that Secretary Blinken has made to 
address really the root causes of migration, particularly in Central America. And if you could talk a little bit more about how that policy shift will be approached. I know we were very thrilled to see the suspension and termination of the asylum cooperative agreements. Our students traveled to Guatemala City um, in January 2020 to um, investigate and document some of the human rights abuses around the implementation of those agreements. So we were really pleased to see that outcome. But I'd, I'd love to to hear more of your thoughts on those policy shifts. Well, I think it, it really comes back to sort of the the foundational point of our, our governments responding to the needs of their people. Um, and Secretary Biden, or Secretary Blinken has um, made the point in various conversations that people choose to make a, an extremely dangerous journey to come to the United States rather than stay in their own countries. And that says a lot about the circumstances that they're dealing with in their own countries. So what are ways that we can work together to address the issues that are making it seem more appealing to take this hazardous, life-threatening journey? Um, what, what can we do to make it so you want to actually stay in your home country? And that does mean, you know, some, some, potentially unpleasant conversations around corruption, um, restricting people's rights, um, the, the kinds of things that either limit the economic growth of the country or make it so that people simply do not find it tolerable to continue to stay there. Um, so it, it goes back to some of the, the fundamental governance issues that we want to work on. I would say it also gets into some of the wider economic growth issues as well. But again, in my thinking, the economic growth piece rises out of that, that governance piece. Yes, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. And Professor Massimino, I wonder if you could take us even broader and bigger picture with migration and think about, are there other priorities for the Biden administration in terms of engaging on the issue of refugees and migration internationally? Yes, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, the migration and the global refugee crisis as we uh, tend to refer to it, although I would point out, I think the real crisis is not the refugees, but the failure of governments to um, uphold their their commitments uh, under international law. But you know, and the and the relationship uh, of migration and forced migration to climate change is you know one of the key challenges that we have to face as a as a nation, but but globally, it's a key example of of a a challenge that can only be truly addressed through global cooperation. Um, and, you know, and it's complicated and it has a lot of different, uh, you know, moving parts, requires cooperation uh, and finding some uh, shared um, values uh, and tons and tons of diplomacy and leadership. Um, and so we are certainly all counting on the Biden administration to provide that kind of leadership. I think that you know it would be uh, useful as a recognition of this need for cooperation for the uh, for the Biden administration to um, to join the global compacts, which is a framework, however imperfect, for addressing these complex. Uh, problems. I do think, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, uh, about uh, Central America. It would be, you know, the the because the problem is so complex, uh, it sometimes can seem insoluble uh, for lots of people, and just people throw up their hands um, and say it's just, you know, uh, too difficult. It would be, um, I think. Uh, very encouraging to to dispel that that sense of of despair about uh, uh, addressing this global challenge. If um, the United States could really focus its um, 
attention and leadership on addressing migration challenges in, in our own neighborhood. Uh, so looking at, um, as you were uh, just saying, uh, the root causes, and, and this is one where, you know, as you said, issues of corruption play a very important role um, in, uh, in undermining the ability to provide lives of dignity for people, um, particularly in the Northern Triangle. But there's also, you know, we have to basically do two things at the same time. We have to address the urgent needs of people who are, you know, knocking on our door, uh, asking for safety, um, and recognize that when someone gets to the point where they have left everything behind and are knocking on our door for safety, the system has already failed many times. Uh, and so we have to deal with the failures of, of that uh, protection system as well. So on, on, the, on the short term piece, I think, um, you know, we were very pleased to see uh, Secretary Mayorkas designating Venezuela for, for temporary protected status. Uh, this week, I think that a generous use of temporary protected status, particularly for people who are here and cannot go back to uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, where you know these devastating hurricanes hit just you know a handful of months ago and has made things even worse uh, than they were before. Uh, that action has a potential to. Uh, protect, you know, more than a million and a half people, uh, probably, who are here uh, living in insecure conditions because they're undocumented. Um, but one of the smart uh, things about taking such generous humanitarian action, though, also is that, you know, we have to fix our, our, uh, our immigration system more broadly at home. Everyone has agreed for decades that it's broken um, and it would help relieve some of the pressures. This is one of those things where it's a you know potential win-win. We need to have some way to relieve all of the, the pressures and the backlog on a system that's designed to, to you know, sort out immigration benefits. At the same time, we need to protect people um, who are in such desperate uh, situations that, as you said, uh, Assistant Secretary, they are um, making a very dangerous trip. And, you know, people make their own calculations. Um, you know, uh, they don't get in the boat or pay the smuggler or turn their children over to strangers unless they are desperate. And uh, we should be asking ourselves, you know, what would we do in those situations? I think we would do what they're doing. Um, but to fix that system, you know, one of the things that uh, that not just the United States, but cooperatively, we have to be doing is thinking ahead, um, trying to get ahead of migration flows that we can predict now. Um, you, you know, I think we may speak about Ethiopia. Uh, a little later, um, but that's the situation where we saw what was brewing for some months before it became now this quite desperate uh, humanitarian catastrophe. Um, no one country can deal with those things on their own, um, but the U.S. Uh, has both the 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 um, resources, even the diplomatic resources, is what I mean to to lead an effort. Um, as it has done in the past, as it did when we faced the crisis of, uh, of Vietnamese refugees, really putting together a plan um, proactively to provide pathways of safety for people and to make sure that host countries have the resources to, um, to protect uh, people in need. So acting Assistant Secretary Peterson, I'd love your thoughts on how we can engage a little bit more um, comprehensively, specifically around the Global Compact of Migration. But also, I want to hear your thoughts. One of the ways in which we do shine a light on what's happening in the world and these other countries and some of the underlying root causes of migration is through the State Department country reports. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the upcoming reports, when they might re be released, and how we can and expect the Biden administration to utilize those country reports? Um, I, I don't feel that I have enough 
inside knowledge of where we are on the global compacts that I want to speak to that piece. On the human rights reports, um, hopefully you will be seeing them soon. Um, I do think they, they are a tool that is used more widely than, than I ever anticipate. Um, you know, I, I learned about another organization today that, that uses the reports um, to help carry asylum cases forward. And I knew that our own Department of Homeland Security was using reports in that manner. And we actually do a fair bit of, we engage with them a fair bit to talk through what appears in the reports. Um, but I, I had not appreciated that um, entities in completely other countries were actually looking at these reports to, to understand what the conditions in a country were and how that might be driving a person to seek asylum. Um, there, there is that sort of direct link to cases that may be coming forward on people who do want to request asylum and the need to sort of do the research, understand the context, and, and we're frankly honored that people would use this product for that purpose. I think there's also room for using the reports as a tool for engagement with at least some of the countries that we're working in. Um, not, not every country is open to having a conversation around um, the way their handling of a demonstration is going to appear in the human rights report. Um, but there are countries, there are individuals there, you can, you can find toeholds in governments to have conversations around that part of the human rights report or around prison conditions, or to go a little bit more broadly to talk about um, if you want your police unit to get training on, uh, I can't think of an issue right now, but you need to go back to this incident that happened three years ago and do something about the people who were involved in that. Otherwise, you're not going to be cleared for training. So we do, you know, this, this all kind of grew out of the human rights reports. Um, I think they're kind of the, the foundation of the other pieces that we've grown into as DRL has, has moved along in time. Um, but I've also had conversations with folks within the Bureau about the ways that we probably should be thinking more expansively about how we, we are using them as tools um, and how are we steering people in the field to you know, pick their two or three issues and set their strategy around those issues for the year. And ideally, in my dream universe, <laughs> um, people are working from that human rights report and also looking at the most recent universal periodic review for that country and identifying goals that we can actually lash up with other diplomatic partners in country to try to move forward on individual issues that appear in those reports. So, sorry, I've gotten a little bit off a, a, a tangent on the yeah. migration piece. But. No, but I think it was sort of a, an opportunity for you to take that shift. And I also <laughs> want to shift a little bit more to some of the specific human rights issues that I think are really top of mind for people today. And I'm going to start with the issue of the Uyghurs in China. Um, Estimates are that China has detained nearly 1 million Uyghur Muslims in re-education camps, and Secretary Blinken has confirmed that he believes that genocide is being committed against this community in China. Um, I'm actually going to ask Professor Massimino to talk a little bit about, first, about how do you think the Biden administration could place additional pressure on China? Um, and what do you think are some actions that activists can take? Um, I know there's been some ideas floated around the Winter Olympics. How can people sort of raise awareness and pressure on China around this issue? Yeah, well, I, I think that, um, you know, China right now, whether it's the 
genocide against the Uyghurs or the repression in Hong Kong uh, or the perfection of digital authoritarianism, you know, probably presents the most pointed, ex you know, uh, example of the choice of vision for the world <laughs> between the United States um, and uh, and and China, um, a vision of respect for human rights, individual freedom, uh, and um, repression and authoritarianism. Uh, on the Uyghurs, you know, there's uh, a, it's hard to know exactly, um, but uh, nearly a million uh, people being held in. And so-called re-education camps, um, and certainly the you know it's quite welcome to have seen human rights being raised in the very first conversations uh, that President Biden uh, and Secretary Blinken have had. Um, I think this is also an area where there is some bipartisan support in Congress uh, to be um, more vocal. In uh, in our criticism of uh, of the Chinese on human rights, um, there's certainly uh, high levels of support amongst the American public for doing that. Um, uh, as you may know, there have been conversations now about a visit uh, by. Um, High Commissioner Bachelet of the, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to go to Xinjiang. Um, I think it's really important that the US pay attention and support her demand for unfettered access in such a trip so as to avoid uh, the uh, Chinese using that um, as propaganda. Uh, but really, I think the, you know, the approach needs to be going back to the very first comment that I made about the centrality of respect for human rights to the vision of the world that we want to see. Um, that you know we really need to integrate the human rights concerns into every conversation that 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 we have uh, with the Chinese um, on on economic issues, on climate issues, on migration issues, on security issues. Um, because the human rights is central to to all of those things. Um, so that that would be, I, I think, kind of the 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 big picture shift that I would advocate for is to, you know, instead of having these kind of siloed dialogues about human rights and say we're going to, okay, now we're going to put all that other stuff aside and we're going to have a nice little conversation where we criticize you and you criticize us about human rights, but really try to model for the Chinese our view that human rights is central, not just to the relationship, but to the vision of the world that we are, are trying to, to pursue. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be sometimes compromises that have to be made. And I, I think we actually need to be working with the Chinese government and Chinese people to solve some of the, the challenges that we face, climate being you know high up on that list. Um, but there should never be any doubt about where we stand and what we think about uh, the treatment of, of uh, Chinese people by their government, whether it's on freedom of religion or uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang or the democracy activists and the people of Hong Kong, um, we have to make sure there's not a lack of, of clarity about, uh, about where we stand and that our policies are going to reflect that. So acting as Assistant Secretary Peterson, yeah, I'd love, I'd love your thoughts on that. I'll let you jump in. <laughs> Thank you. So just, just to highlight one of the areas that I'm not sure people often think about when they think about um, human rights and our US foreign policy engagement, and this is the way we engage with business in an environment. Well, we, we engage with business more broadly, but this has come up specifically in the context of Xinjiang. Um, and we, we've issued a business advisory for those who 
were doing business um, in Xinjiang, warning them of the, the reputational risks um, and giving them guidance on how they could sort of scrub their supply chains to be sure that they were not selling products that were made with forced labor um, or made with um, cotton that had come from Xinjiang. Um, and this is the kind of sort of, I, I would say outside the box, but I, it's not even outside the box anymore. Um, it is something that we are doing more and more frequently pulling in that business piece because there's a lot that may happen between us as governments or government to people, government to civil society interactions. But if you don't have that business piece engaged, um, there's a lot that's going to keep going on. And so sensitizing business to the human rights issues and the ways that things can blow back on them, but also giving them the tools to understand how they can not fall victim to their own practices, um, I think is also a helpful way of sort of putting down markers on some of these issues in a way that that government to government interaction is never going to accomplish. Yeah, I'm so glad that you raised that. Um, it uh, not only is such a critical point, but it also reminds me that I forgot to answer Melissa's question about the Olympics. Um, uh, but, um, you know, that that's the the Chinese are hosting the Olympics um, uh, next year. Um, and uh, and so we're a year out. And so there's a lot of folks talking about the, you know, potential uh, leverage that uh, that people may have to um, to shift the thinking of the Chinese government. Um, you know, there are, I think there are a lot of options and I, I would encourage the Biden administration to, to be thinking about this now. Um, uh, I would say that the administration ought to consider not sending high level government officials uh, to represent the United States at the Olympics. I think cultural icons and dignitaries ought to think about not going. Um, this the, the Olympics um, poses a, a, an opportunity for a huge uh, um, public relations lift for the Chinese government, uh, and I think it's important for us to be clear-eyed about that and and uh, and to prevent uh, that from happening as much as possible. And a piece of that is is the um, the corporate sponsors. Airbnb, Bridgestone, Coca-Cola, GE, Intel, there are a bunch of big American companies um, that are uh, sponsors of the Olympics. And, you know, I, I'm not saying or suggesting that athletes shouldn't go or that there should be a boycott or anything like that. I mean, love to see how this all plays out. Um, but uh, but we need to approach this with the soberness that it requires when you know, for yet a second time, the Chinese government is hosting what many people will be calling the Genocide Olympics. Um, and we need to be thinking about uh, that right now. So it's great to hear that the Biden's administration's approach in includes some of these thoughts and strategies around areas of corporate social responsibility or even business and human rights compliance in order to have strong partners in the private sector to really support the advancement and protection of human rights. Um, one of the things that we talked about with China was, um, you know, the democratic crackdown that's happening in Hong Kong and the arrest of protesters there. Um, I'm curious to talk a little bit more about that, but also a little bit about what's happening in Burma right now in the aftermath of what the State Department has determined is, in fact, a military coup. Um, you mentioned that President Biden hopes to host a, um, a summit on, on these issues. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about the big picture in these two specific areas and then transition a little bit to what's happening in Burma right now. You're muted. I know. <laughs> um, so on Hong Kong, I, I will confess I have had um, not not had 
the, the level of conversations around business engagement on Hong Kong. Obviously, um, we are extremely concerned about the actions that the, the government is taking to really close the democratic space um, and not not abide by the the commitments for the way Hong Kong was supposed to operate. Um, so this is this is an area of really deep concern for us. But moving on to Burma, um, obviously, you know things things start with the concerns about the coup itself and trying to find new and ever more creative ways to put pressure on the people who carried out that coup um, with, frankly, a lot of observers saying it just doesn't look like the leaders are going to be willing to step back away from the action that they've taken. And so trying to formulate a response that has an impact um, with that sort of outside voice saying your, your chances are not great. Um, so that that first level is the, a, a difficult puzzle to un, unravel. But now, you know, the, the added layer of the level of government brutality that is being deployed, um, the the stunning way in which the Burmese have continued to stand up and speak out on the way they want this to go, um, the ways that we've had to try to pivot to try to protect people that we may have been working with in the past. Um, it, it's all, to be honest, a little bit overwhelming, and it is, I expect, something that is going to drive a lot of our, a lot of our discussions, a lot of our policy actions um, for the foreseeable future, um, because there's not, you know, we've we've done sanctions before, and we are doing sanctions again. You know, we are continuing to roll out sanctions, but. Um, it does reach a point where you you start to wonder is this having the impact that that we hoped it would have yeah so i think recently there was a statement issued by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar, Tom Andrews, and he was really calling on the Security Council to take more coordinated, decisive, and unified action in this situation. And so I'm wondering if you're working closely um, with Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfeld and what sort of actions are is the U.S. considering and what's on the table in working with the Security Council on this? So we certainly are lashed up with New York. Um, and have to applaud um, the courage of the Burmese perm rep in New York. Um, in terms of specific actions, I know it it has been it, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, so I I don't have a lot of specifics for you there. I do think um, you know we we in general are fans of multilateral approaches. Um, because that does that obviously that brings more more voices to the discussion and brings more weight. Um, but at this moment in time, I don't have a, a lot of specifics on what might be the next um, point of approach in either New York or Geneva. Professor Mosmino, it looked like you wanted to jump in there as well. Uh, I do. I on a couple of points. One, just on the, I hear in your voice uh, the sense of you know how how tragic this this is um, and how frustrating it is to have so few uh, tools of leverage. Um, and you know, all of us who work on human rights, as, as you do, that's a familiar feeling. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's tempting, and I know that 
there will be some folks uh, who think of themselves as realists um, who say, look, you know, we don't really have any way forward here. So we should, you know, kind of not waste our, our energy and capital in, in doing what some people would call virtue signaling and just saying that, you know, we're, what you're doing is bad and you know, stop. Um, but I would caution against that uh, in part because, you know, having spent most of my career working with human rights activists over uh, in other countries, um, I think in the United States, we tend to underestimate the power of what I would call value signaling um, and, and consistently making clear, even in situations where our maneuverability on policy is very narrow, um, to be unrelenting in our clarity about who, with whom we stand in the struggle between uh, democracy and repression. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield really, uh, you know, has said over and over how incredibly moved she and all of us are by the courage uh, of, of the Burmese people in continuing to stand up, even now with, you know, with the terrible violence. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, while we may be stymied in the Security Council, I, I think I saw that the General Assembly was having a closed door meeting on Friday about, uh, about this. And, you know, one thing uh, that the UN can do uh, is, you know, decide who is it's going to recognize as the representatives of, of a government. Um, and the fact that the Burmese people have continued to take to the streets and to resist. And I, I think in a way, perhaps that the junta did not anticipate um, is, a, is a very uh, powerful thing to see, but also um, has legal implications uh, for, um, for who is the legitimate representative in, in intergovernmental bodies of, of the Burmese people. Uh, so I think there, you know, we may have to get creative, but even in places where the, where the uh, lane is quite narrow, um, I think uh, the voice of, of the United States of America continues to resonate and we need to keep using it until we're hoarse. So I'm just a little mindful of time and I want to address one last really important issue before we move on to some questions from um, our participants. Um, in talking about the issue with the, these atrocity crimes committed against the Uyghurs in China and um, what's happening in Burma right now and even what happened before the re recent coup with the Rohingya, um, you know, it really, it, it it calls for a very strong international response. And a lot of people would say that the, the right response is from the International Criminal Court. And indeed, the prosecutor has opened an investigation into the situation with the Rohingya and what falls within their jurisdiction in Bangladesh. Um, but I think that for a lot of human rights activists, they were very dismayed when the Trump administration imposed sanctions on the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC. And I think that a lot of people sort of expect Expected that one of the first things the Biden administration would do would be to lift those sanctions because those are really designed, you know, to to punish those who are who are violating international human rights laws and that are threats to our national security, not to impose them against lawyers who are trying to fight against impunity for atrocity crimes. Um, I know the State Department has said that they're under review and determining the next step. And I'm wondering if you could give us some insight on that process and when we might see some change there. I'm afraid I don't have anything more for you all. I can say is to reiterate that we are thoroughly reviewing the sanctions and trying to determine what our next steps will be. I also want to underscore that there, there may still be exceptional cases where we might actually consider cooperating with the court. Um, if you look at, back at the case of Dominique Ongwen from the, from the Lord's Resistance Army, um, 
we it, look, obviously we have a, a complicated history with the ICC, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not willing to find ways to work with the ICC when we think it makes sense and, and we have the means to do so. Um, but in terms of the sanctions, all I can say is we're, we're, we're still reviewing and trying to figure out where we go from here. It seems like you want to jump in. For yeah, some, you know, some additional thoughts, but go ahead. I think that, um, yes, the, the United States has had a love-hate relationship with the ICC almost from the very beginning, you know, being very involved in, in drafting uh, of the Rome statute that led to the creation of the International Criminal Court. Um, but then, you know, signing and unsigning and, uh, but I, you know, but it, but, but the United States has not had a love hate relationship with the idea of, of accountability and atrocity prevention. And, you know, has always been uh, steadfast in support of, of that uh, ideal. So I think, it, you know, as that review is, is ongoing, um, that, you know, a lot of times, particularly opponents of the ICC tend to pre present this as kind of this binary choice, you know, and you have to be all in and say that the ICC is perfect and everything, or, you know, you have to throw sanctions on, on people who are trying to pursue justice. Um, and I, I, it's obviously more nuanced than that. And I think there are a lot of steps that the United States could take. First among them, though, really must be lifting these sanctions. Um, but but beyond that, um, you know, I think the United States ought to be looking for ways, even separate from the ICC, but it will be related to the to the International Criminal Court, should be looking for ways to strengthen its support for international justice efforts more broadly, you know, ought to not be withholding support from multilateral, you know, uh, resolutions or declarations. Um, around international justice issues, just because the ICC is mentioned, it's not a disease. Uh, it's part of the cure. It is not the cure either. Um, it is, you know, I, I, I think my organization, uh, former organization, was very involved in the the work of of drafting of the Rome Statute, and and really saw the creation of the ICC as one of the main benefits was to create a world in which you didn't need an ICC. Uh, and, and in fact, that it would spur the development of accountability mechanisms domestically in countries around the world so that, uh, so that the ICC really is an in extreme situation, you know, break glass kind of uh, tool that would fill in the, the gaps in the web of, of uh, impunity. So uh, I think there are lots of steps that, that the United States could, if it's crafting a, a policy around international justice and promoting justice for atrocity crimes and preventing atrocity crimes, um, the ICC can be a part of that, um, but it need not be the, the be all end all. Yeah, and I would just like to add, I think that there's concern among um, law professors and other human rights institutes like Georgetown, particularly ones that do a lot of work with the ICC um, that you might have read about in the lawsuits that have been filed for the dual nationals or foreign nationals that are doing this work. Um, there's a fear that they would be caught up in these sanctions because of their work supporting the office of the prosecutor. And so I think it's, it's really important to send a consistent message on where the United States stands. And while it is true, um, the State Department did cheer the recent verdict against the former commander of the Lord's Resistance Army, I think it sends a, it sends a conflicted message to um, really sanction the work of the Office of the Prosecutor. Um, but I think if we're turning, um, we have just 15 minutes left and we have probably five pages of audience questions. <laughs> um, so it's hard to decide which one. I know we had talked about touching on issues in Yemen and Ethiopia, some of these really hot button um, humanitarian crises, if you could maybe share a couple of thoughts on those two, two regions of the world and what you're prioritizing to address these challenges. Um, so Ethiopia, um, 
you know, it is the, the, the atrocity in human rights and, and humanitarian situation there is obviously of uh, the, the driving concern at the moment, but this all happens against the backdrop of what I think folks were somewhat optimistic about in terms of broader reform efforts. And so we now have uh, kind of the, a double track of really trying to trying to get consistent access for people to be able to get in and deal with the humanitarian situation, but also get in and be able to conduct a credible um, independent investigation so that you get at um, the the justice piece after everything that has transpired and possibly still is transpiring. Um, so, you know, we, we follow that closely. We have repeatedly strongly condemned um, the actions in Tigray. Um, we have, there have been multiple conversations at, at various levels of leadership. Um, and it's, there, there are the humanitarian and human rights issues. There are the, um, the broader issues of use of internet shutdowns in Tigray and the way government um, controlled information flow. Um, and as much as we want to, obviously we have to get through the current sort of crisis mode and crisis situation, um, we're still hoping to get to a point, maybe it's not back to, back to a point, but to a point of addressing issues through discourse, through political processes, through respect for rule of law, um, and trying to get back to reform efforts that we, we thought held some promise for the country. So this is a really, really massive derailment, um, I, I feel. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, one of the other specific issues that have come up through the audience questions that were sent um, prior to this event, I think one of the issues that's not getting as much attention, it seems, by the Biden administration or in the press is what's happening in Haiti right now. I think there's um, a lot of concerns about President Moyes holding on to power, um, and there's a sense that there's um, Haiti's at risk of descending further into a constitutional crisis. So what can the Biden administration do to support the rule of law in Haiti? Um, so we have been urging the government to come out of this phase of rule by decree um, and get back to a point where you actually have um, the, the, the different levers of government that are supposed to be there doing the work that they are supposed to be doing. Um, we, we do see this as a very concerning situation and one that does not seem to be poised to turn itself in the right direction anytime soon. So it's an area that we are trying to engage in and try to really get the government, get, get Moise focused on the need to turn away from the way he has been doing things and get the country back to the mechanisms that it, it actually does have in place on paper um, to have the sort of checks and balances in the system that ideally we would like to see them have. Well, Lisa, uh, Professor Massimino, did you want to jump in? I just, I just wanted to draw attention, uh, particularly for the students, to um, to that answer because um, it really does so much of the challenge uh, of advancing human rights around the world falls to American diplomats just doing the difficult work day to day. And that's something that Acting Assistant Secretary uh, Peterson has spent her whole career doing, um, particularly in Africa. So I'm glad we finally are touching on uh, some situations in Africa where she has such deep expertise. But I just, you know, we talked in my in my class actually last week about the importance of thinking about people in government who are doing this difficult work as allies in many ways in the fight for human rights and how we can work together uh, 
to solve these problems. And, and you know, uh, Vice President Harris uh, always talks about just doing the work. Like we can say a lot of things, but, you know, the grinding, <laughs> difficult work of um, it, it often in such challenging circumstances uh, of just doing the work of American diplomacy. Um, you know, I think so many Americans take for granted. And it's it's really wonderful to see uh, Secretary Blinken and the Biden administration as a whole really uh, investing seriously in um, building back up uh, one of the most crucial uh, departments of the U.S. government and um, where so many patriots serve and have served uh, to advance uh, these values abroad. It is difficult, difficult work, and it's it's life and death work in many uh, in many circumstances. So I just wanted to underscore that answer just reminded me of this is really hard. It takes American leadership. It takes going back to the table and being creative and talking to people who don't want to hear what you have to say and to do it day after day after day. And so just great respect um, for you and all of the uh, folks at the State Department who are doing this work. One of the questions that we did get from the audience that relates to that is, you know, in such an environment where we can be really inundated with news of human rights violations that are happening around the world, really day after day after day, it becomes easy to become blind to some of these atrocities. Um, so I'd love to hear from both of you in your careers how you combat some of this compassion fatigue and how you really continue to shine a light on some of these human rights issues that need our attention and need our support and need our advocacy. Why don't we start with Professor Massimino and then end with Acting Assistant Secretary. Uh, okay, well, um, uh, you know, um, we all have to find ways of, of refilling the tank, right? It's this long journey uh, that never really seems to end. Uh, of trying to uplift these these values and to work to have, make our own uh, communities fairer and and more just, um, and so you know on a personal level, I think it's really important to know what it is that makes you happy and to make time to do that. I'm speaking just very personally from you know this is not something you tend to hear in like. Uh, activism and diplomacy 101 probably but it's really important to be able to you know to understand that um you know this is people talk about it's you know not a sprint it's a marathon or whatever but it's really a relay and 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 we have our our period of time where we're uh carrying the baton and and really need to make sure that we're equipped uh to uh to carry it uh, personally i get um, you know, as, as tragic as it sometimes is, we've all have worked with people who are advancing human rights in their own societies in such difficult circumstances, risking and sometimes losing their, their lives, um, to, to feel such deep sadness about that. Um, but it is a reminder about the value of the values that, that we share, and how every single person has a role to play in advancing um, that vision of the world that, that we want. So, you know, I also like to tell my students that, you know, one way of, of combating that kind of fatigue is to design campaigns with outcomes and then win them. <laughs> and that is also very, uh, very uplifting. The wins can be few and far between, but um, but they are there, and we should not forget that they're there. Um, we there are we don't talk to each other enough about the successes and the power of the 
of human rights to transform lives and how it's really working. Um, and we should spend more time doing that. Uh, we are always off to the next challenge and the next fight and, um, and it can be exhausting, but, um, but we need to take the opportunity to, uh, to think about what's worked and to, to learn from that and to be Um, Acting Assistant Secretary Peterson, what are what are your thoughts and any other final words that you have for us in our last few minutes? So someone from my staff actually asked me a similar question not long ago, and, and my answer was um, celebrate the small victories. Um, you know, it it can be overwhelming to focus only on the most dire cases and you know, a lot of times our work only allows time to deal with the most dire cases. But really durable change is going to come from a thousand small changes, a thousand small actions. You know, we, we have a bad tendency of kind of telling the, the civil rights story as there was the March on Washington and there was the Civil Rights Act. And like, not at all looking at you know, people who were uh, the, the loads of people who had to desegregate lots of other institutions um, before we got to the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, just all those little pieces that add up into a bigger whole. And I think you need to pause once in a while, both for yourself to celebrate the small victories, but also for the people who have carried out those victories. Um, because I think you can find yourself in a country where it seems like the problems are overwhelming and it seems like there's absolutely nothing you can do, but no one's talking about, hey, this diverse group of NGOs who normally compete for funding got themselves together and got this law passed. And just keep reminding people of, where where there have been victories and you know find ways to sort of draw the dotted line to what the next victory could be um yeah i think i will leave it there thank you thank you very much for um inviting me to be part of this today well, we are so pleased that you could join us today. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your enormously busy schedule. And thank you as well, Professor Massimino. It was such a privilege to hear both of your thoughts on some of the huge challenges that we face. And I think we're all just holding on to some of those hopeful visions about celebrating the small victories and looking for the positive change as we continue on in the early days of the Biden administration. So thank you so much again for joining us. Thanks. Thanks very much.